And so we turn on a headlamp and we can see the, the, the river bank and we're not moving. Mm-hmm. We're just paddling against the current because the current's going In out. Place. Yeah, we're yeah. paddling and, and not moving. <laughs> It's like, oh my God. And they, they warned us. Yeah. They warned us not to uh, anchor on the, on the land at night because of the crocodiles. Because of crocodiles. (laughs) But we were just like going nowhere. So we we seen this tree, it was overhanging. So we tied our boats up to it and we're like, Hey, this is a great time to get some sleep. So in the crocodile water, in the crocodile water, in our boats, <laughs> at in the dark. So yeah, I'm sure I would not have got a wink of sleep that other day. It was a great idea. Welcome back to the Adaptive Zone podcast. My name is Matthew Boyd. I'm a physiotherapist and running coach. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're so inclined, share it with a friend. Today we're going to be talking with Teresa Harrison all about adventure racing a subject about which I know very little. And so I'm going to leave it to Teresa to explain all about it and why it's so exciting and might be something that you're excited to get involved with. Before we get into that, I want to let you guys know that I have finally finished my marathon training program that I've been working on for quite some time. It's a 20-week program, and you can get that by clicking the link in the description. It is really geared at intermediate runners, so anyone who's completed a marathon or half marathon within the last 12 to 18 months and for people who are not currently injured, because it is quite high mileage. It includes a lot of strength training, a lot of speed work, some very long runs. And the idea is to really push your fitness in order to break that PR. So it's not maybe the best for those coming back from injury or having recurring injuries. It's what I call a dynamic training program. So what it does is use those fitness tests that we've been talking about on the Adaptive Zone podcast for some time now, and uses those to calibrate your pace zones and your heart rate zones and specify the workouts based on the results of those fitness tests. As your fitness improves during the course of the training program, your zones will increase, so the program will move with you as your fitness increases. Because it's dynamic, this program will work well for people who run slow or run fast because the paces and the heart rate zones are going to be based on tests that you do yourself. And in that way, it's going to work with you at your current level. So anyway, I think it's pretty good. So I hope you like it. And if you just want to download it, click the link in the description. And if you use it and it goes well or it goes badly, please let me know. You can shoot me an email, mvoidphysio at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, I'd be very grateful for the feedback. Anyway, without further ado from me, let's get into the episode with Teresa Harrison talking all about adventure racing. Um, So... Teresa Harrison, (laughs) welcome back to the Adaptive Zone podcast. You are our first return guest. Congratulations. Yay. Wow. That's an honor. (laughs) So for those who didn't catch the first episode with you, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself before we crack on? Uh, My name is Teresa Harrison. I'm a recreational uh, triathlete and adventure racer. Um, I've been doing these for 23 years, Um, triathlons that is, adventure racing for 11 years and I do a bit of triathlon coaching and I have my own restaurant that I run and manage and yeah that's that's about it oh and so loads of spare time yeah Xterra racing as well yeah loads of spare time so uh, let's start there you had a you had a victory recently in the Xterra can you tell us a little bit about that yeah Xterra Maui uh, world Championships. I came first in my age group, so I'm an age group world champion. That was exciting, and they had canceled the swim this year, the first time ever because of weather conditions. Oh, so they turned it I into a duathlon. Yeah. So Which before was... we get into adventure racing, could you just, for those who don't know, explain what Nextera is? Oh, Nextera is off-road triathlon. So you would use a mountain bike and you swim in the ocean or a lake. Uh, and then you trail run, which is a little more difficult than a uh, road road race. Was my introduction to triathlon was um, extra. I've got the t-shirt on. Oh yeah, right on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was thinking, I was like, 
I want to try a triathlon, but I don't want to buy all the gear, but I already have a mountain bike. And then someone mentioned Xterra and I thought, I'll give oh man, I loved it. I sucked. I was terrible. It took me forever. I think I was like last in my year <laughs> or, or second last, but I, I loved it. So I did that Xterra in Canmore maybe three years ago now, just before COVID. Yeah. So um, that was my first triathlon. Um, and yeah, for anyone interested in triathlon, I'd recommend, it's an easy one to kind of get into because a lot of people have a mountain bike, whereas a lot of people don't have like a road bike yeah. or a triathlon bike. Yeah. But today we're going to be talking about adventure racing, which, you know, may not be familiar to most of my listeners. So it wasn't that familiar to me, <laughs> I had a vague idea what it was, but yeah. I've been learning a bit about it this week and it's pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. So mm-hmm. you're going to hopefully give us a sort of idiot's guide and, and get us into it and understand what's going on. Yeah. So if we just start with the easy question. I guess it might not be that easy, actually. Um, what is adventure racing? Adventure racing. Well, if you take the foundation of orienteering and orienteering uh, racing, which is you have a compass and a map, and you go from checkpoint to checkpoint, no GPS, and you do it as fast as you can, and in a in a time, usually in a, under a time limit. And mm-hmm. so that's the the basic of it, and then okay. Um, at layer in for adventure racing you have to layer in because orienteering is usually just running so mm-hmm. adventure racing you add in ropes uh whitewater rafting kayaking canoeing uh pack rafting and mountain biking and it's usually over a series of days um for mm-hmm. expedition um or you there's one day races okay. um, but it's the same thing as you're still looking for checkpoints with a compass so, and a map. And it's not the, the disciplines are not set. So it's not like triathlon where mm-hmm. it's always like swim, bike, run. It's a uh, different discipline. So whether it be rafting, mountain biking, hiking, running, these yeah. are the ones I've seen. Are, are there others? Uh, that's, that's generally what it is. Um, and they can be in any order and they, they may reoccur. So depending on the length of the race, um, mm-hmm. you know, like in Costa Rica for nine days, we seen our bike three times. We kayak three times and it trekked, I think three, three or four times. So, right, okay. Yeah. And they range in distance, which would depend how many, you know, days it took. So this sort of single day adventure races that are obviously not going to be as far. And then yeah. there's multi-day adventure races. So on a single day, I think we get it, you know, the, you're going to have your gear and stuff stashed at the correct checkpoint in advance, and then you change from one discipline to the other. When it comes to multi-day events, like how does it work? Do they take the time that you do each bit in and you all start together the next day? Or do you sort of sleep on the course wherever you like fall down? Like, <laughs> how does that work? Well, that's pretty much, that sums it all up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, on uh okay on one day events um depends on the on how the race is set up the race organizers will transport your bike or your bin a transition bin which has different gear in it whether trek gear bike gear food they'll transport it to an a location which you have no idea where it is except for on a map you'll you have to find it um the distances are not set, but the time is set. The distances are set for them. Um, you may zigzag a bit or get lost, which makes the distance longer mm-hmm. or shorter, depending on okay. the route, your route choice. Um, I see. Yes. That's a bit different. So it, unlike triathlon where it's like follow the the course, if you go off course, you're disqualified. This is not a set course. It's... Huh you go through these trees or, or go around these trees, or you may, you may take a bushwhack or may take the road (laughs) around. Like it, you choose your route. Um, but you need to get to this certain checkpoint, which you need to find. So on, on longer days, um, they're usually unsupported. Your food is all in your bins for your calories for the entire event pre-packed and But the race organizers will move it for you. So you don't have to carry like nine days worth of food, which I don't even know if that is that possible. (laughs) I I don't think so. But they'll move the food. So you'll get it 
uh, I'm guessing at the at a specific checkpoint. Yeah, and it's usually when be... you're changing from one discipline to another, like truck okay. to bike or bike to kayak or something. And, and on a multi day event, is that when you sleep? Um, it could be. Um, oh, okay. It it depends on your strategy. Uh, sometimes oh. you don't sleep until the first thirty six hours, thirty eight hours you know, 48 hours, and then you might catch a couple hours sleep. Um, so it's all strategy. Sometimes there's dark zones in the paddling sections, like on the river. So if you're rushing to get to, say, a river, a uh, whitewater uh, in the daytime, and you don't have time to sleep, you got to push through mm -hmm. to get there in time before cutoff. Um, same with rope sections. Sometimes they're, they don't have a nighttime rope section. And mm -hmm. if, if you miss cutoff, it's called dark zone. And then you have to stay there till and daytime wait. and wait. So if you can push through and get there before cutoff, do the discipline. Then you can mm -hmm. continue through the night on something else like the bike or the track. So, I have so many questions. I'm almost, I don't even know what order to ask them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, your strategy for sleep is sometimes course dependent and sometimes okay. um on how the team is doing which in right. a shorter shorter event usually it's a two-person team and a longer mm -hmm. one is four-person team and what are the rules with team is it like if one person can't finish then essentially the team gets a dnf or is you know is it as long as one of you sort of limps over the line that it's a finish like how does that work yeah so i it depends on the race but generally um yeah, it's not, it depends, it depends on the race and how you, you execute dropping that person. So if you separate for any reason, your your DNF, um, but if you can get to transition and continue on with, say, three people instead of two, um, then you go as, um, un, they call it unranked. I, I don't know if they call that it, that term anymore. It's term unranked. So if someone loses other teams lose team members or take a shortcut um, through a section of course, um, then you're called unranked. So you're not a full course. And then you're ranked amongst mm -hmm. other teams that are unranked, that are missing team members or missing. I see what you mean. Course. So it's, and I'm guessing that if you're looking at, you know, maybe qualif qualifying places or actually winning the event, you wouldn't be able to on the unranked side is that right yeah you just yeah. you just file into different rankings so you'll never be in the top you might be the top of the unranked but you're you'll be yeah filed in as a you know down the line okay yeah. Yeah. all right i think that gives everybody a basic understanding but I think what we'll do is try and go through a specific example to try because it's so hard to wrap your head around. I've been watching videos about this all week, just trying to understand yeah. how it works. Um, yeah. I guess before we move on to the specific example, the you know you were saying you know you have to so there'll be I don't know let's say five checkpoints that you have to get to, and you can take any route you want. So you have to look at some maps at that point, you know, at the start, I'm guessing they give you a, a little bit beforehand. Yeah, usually the night before and sometimes right. like in Costa Rica, we didn't get our maps until after the race started. It was a Le Mans oh, okay. start. Yeah, Le Mans start where they try to separate teams a bit. Yeah. So it was right on the border of uh, Panama, Costa Rica, right up the south border. And they yeah. had us run a mile uphill go to our bikes and our bikes are in boxes and you had to right. assemble our bikes and our maps were at our bike boxes <laughs> so we literally had no right. idea where we were going until huh, okay we got to transition and got the maps and assembled our bike okay yeah and then so when you get your maps whenever they Dan to give you them <laughs> you yeah. have to figure out what you believe is going to be the quickest route from checkpoint to checkpoint yeah. and at that time I don't know or, or at some point as you're going you're going to have to figure out if and when you're going to sleep if it's a multi-day event where right. you want to be by x amount of time to try and um build your race plan on yeah. the move really you can't yeah. do much in advance it sounds like 
Nope, not much in advance. <laughs> so <laughs> most most races they give them to you at like seven eight p.m. and okay. then you're looking at maps, determining distance between checkpoints and time to to get from A to B. Um, looking for identifiers on the map uh, to not get lost. Uh, sort of route planning, mm-hmm. and you're doing that for you know, better part of the night. And then you might get a few hours sleep before the race starts next day. So it's, it's quite different from a lot of races in, you know, in the more, uh, what do you would call it? Conventional races where, you know, the distance, you know, the start time, you know, the route, uh, you can make your race plan in advance. In fact, you know, everything really in advance, mm-hmm. even with the long, uh, races, like the ultra multi-day events and stuff, you, you kind of know it all in advance. Whereas this one's a different kind of test. It's also a team event with, you know, not a, only multiple disciplines, but you're having to figure out what to do without being able to plan, which is a very different skill um, mm-hmm. to what you might normally come across in endurance running and triathlon and stuff. It's, it's a brain thing too. Oh yeah. It's, you know what? Adventure racing is probably, I don't know, I'd say like 75% mental. Right. Uh, Mental in the way that uh, you're fatigued. So you're always pushing to to stay going. There's pain, there's physical pain. So you're mentally trying to not think about that. Um, You know, you're, you're hungry, you're tired. So mentally, you're trying not to um, let the team down. And you, you don't want to be down because you want to bring the team down. You want to stay positive. Um, and then for the navigator, there's one navigator on a team and a backup. Uh, mentally for them, it, it's really exhausting to, hmm. to, try to try to remember to fuel and then constantly be thinking about route planning, the best way to go. So hmm. um and then the other side of it's just endurance and strategy. Yeah. Okay. So you've been in, I think you said you'd been doing it for quite a while. Did you say 10, 11 years or, or something Yeah, about like that? 11 years um, yeah. for expedition racing. Yeah. And how did you get into it? Um, I have a, a, my sister-in-law knew a guy <laughs> who needed, you need a female on every team, at least one female. And okay. they had they lost they had one drop out and they needed one and that year I was training for Ironman, yeah. and she says my sister in law is tough as nails she'd be great, um, <laughs> which I didn't even own a mountain bike like Voluntold. I had to oh man I had to find a mountain bike within a week and so that's how you got into mountain biking, yeah that's exactly and became how. Xterra world champion for your age yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. an interesting little um, yeah. uh, turn of fate yeah and then. Um, so I did my first one in in California in the Sierra Nevada mountains, which was great. Um, oh wow! Then we did Maine, uh, Wyoming, which was ex- extremely hot. Uh, they're all four day events, and then mm-hmm. Costa Rica, which was a nine day events or nine day event. It was uh, World Championships, and that was 2013. And then mm. did P- Panama just last February, just a couple months ago. We're not going to talk about Panama. Let's talk about the others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Panama, we, we didn't get to complete. So we, uh, we don't mention Panama. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's a gr- great country to go see, though. It's a great country. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, again, I think it'll be most helpful for people if we kind of go back through that first getting into it. So, you know, you, you're voluntold by your sister in law, you're going to do this <laughs> event, and you're like Googling what is adventure racing and it's yeah. a four day. I mean was Google even yeah 11 years ago Google was about so and you're yeah. looking and and so what like, take us through that first event like what were the disciplines and um you know how did you go from not knowing what it was to actually getting self prepared to go and do it uh well um training for ironman um very good with endurance and eating uh, fueling strategies. Um, the race on an, on expeditions, they do tell you uh, the order that you're 
events will be in your disciplines Mm -hmm. and they tell you approximately they give you a range of hours that you'll be doing it so that way you can plan your food and you lay you lay everything out on a bed and you're making peanut butter and jam sandwiches and you got your cliff bars and gels and all your hydration and then you're packing them into boxes on how in bags of calories so oh, four days worth it sounds so gross just eat, just eating waste food for four days sounds awful oh, nine days was even worse but <laughs> yeah, I got yeah. That. so you're packing them in bags of like 500 calories or a thousand calorie bags so oh, then okay. so you're thinking about how many calories am i going to use in this uh-huh. in this stage so they say yeah. the stage is i don't know 18 hours and then you're thinking mm-hmm. okay i'm going to use um, you know, 15,000 calories on that stage. So you're grabbing, here's my liquid calories, my shake mixes on my, these other bags with the bars or whatever, and you're mm-hmm. throwing them into that bin. Um, and so I was kind of the, the food and hydration Nazi on our team. Just okay. like, it's like, okay, it's, you know, time to drink or okay. time to eat and try to get the team going that way. Um, cause I knew very little else about the sport right? until yeah. I got but into You sort it. of took that from your Ironman experience which, where it's viable yeah. and, yeah. and you know, it's all, it's one of the, it's kind of that forced eating, isn't it? You don't, you're not hungry. You don't feel like it, mm-hmm. but you know, you have to, and, and you, you have to plan in advance and you have to know when and how long and how many calories to take. So it's, I mean, it's, uh, obviously yeah. extrapolated over a longer time period. But it's that same. I'm not sure what the word is, but that same understanding of getting those calories on and how to do it. So yeah, uh, it, if you don't get them in, you're you're in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah. And then leading up to that race too, uh, I knew no, I'd never been on ropes before. So what, what were the disciplines for the that first race? Uh, it's mountain biking, um, kayaking, and uh, trekking ropes and ropes. So we had to okay, do a r- so, rappel. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I was a bit confused about that. Like, do you carry a climbing gear and a harness and ropes are very heavy. Like, I can't imagine you guys yeah. are carrying them, are you? So uh, how does that bit work? Yeah. So the race organizers will have a rope section set up. And okay. Then you bring your harness, a helmet, an approved helmet, um, and whatever you need. Gloves, your rappelling device. Uh, it's usually specified what kind you you have to have, uh, like a figure do eight. They... Generally, is not allowed. And... Okay, and do, do they your so your uh, let's call it your climbing gear or rope yeah. gear? Do you leave that at the the rope stage and pick it up and then do a, like a rope stage, or is it more part of like a trekking stage and you sort of carry it through the whole trek? Yeah. Generally, it's mixed in with a truck stage, and you have to okay. carry it with you. Right, okay. Um, you know, there are certain surprises, uh, like in another race, we'll, uh, it's trekking pack raft. So you'll be trekking a long ways, and then you're going to have to pack raft. So you, the pack rafts, um, you know, they're about this big, and it's it's in your pack it's extra weight you got to carry your paddles so you stick your paddles mm-hmm. in your pack and your uh pf or your pfd your life jacket you clip but that you, on the back you blow it up or do you have some sort of device that blow? i have very <laughs> it's almost silly questions like how do you get yeah. the thing inflated <laughs> yeah either carry a pump with you um there's some pack rafts you can blow up with air right um but yeah, generally, is it like a like a pump, like pump, a pump with, you. with your pump with your hands, like you would a bike tire or something? Yeah, like a little hand pump. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. And then you pump, and then yeah. is there like multiple? So you you raft a bit, then you deflate it and hike a bit. Then you're like, oh no, there's another river, and you pump it back. <laughs> like yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. It depends on the race. I mean, there there could be multiple water sections where you can just portage the boat. You don't deflate it. Um, but there's some that you deflate, pack it away, and then you just keep your keep trekking, and then you know you end up at the transition for a bike section or something. 
Right. Okay. And yeah. so in advance of that event, you said you had to get a mountain bike or did you borrow one? I was going to borrow one. And then the girl that uh, was going to lend me her bike, it kind of broke down. So then mm. I had a friend that was teaching us how to do the ropes. He, he was selling his cross country race bike. So I bought it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that one worked well it enough? Was great. Do, like, do you oh, need yeah. a. Okay. Yeah, it was a great bike. And... Yeah. Yeah. And do you, for the mountain bike sections, do you have, you know, do they tell you, oh, you're going to need like a, a rear suspension and a front suspension bike, you know, because obviously they're a lot heavier? Or do they say, you know, you're going to need more like a, a hard tail or, or one, even like, I don't know what uh, gravel bikes look like because I don't have one. But do you know what I mean? Do they tell you the type of bike you're going to use? Is it ever a road yeah. bike? Like, how does that bit work? Um, it's never road bike, it's always okay. mountain bike. Uh, okay. hy hybrid you would not these courses are rough okay. uh, costa rica we went through a few spokes like spokes just busting off uh, mm -hmm. you need good sturdy preferably full suspension mm -hmm. you could do it on a hardtail but i don't know why you would it's a long time okay. and it's hard on your back and your knees and your butt if you want the, <laughs> the most okay. comfort as possible uh, so you want okay. a good full suspension bike. Uh, yeah. yeah. So talk us through again, that first race, like, uh, what was the first, um, do you call it discipline? The first section, what, what were you doing first? Oh man, this is going way back. I honestly, I don't even remember. Um, okay. W w let's maybe go the one you said that you did that was a nine day event. Is that more recent? Can you remember that more easily? Yeah. I mean, I can give you examples of the first or a mix a mix of a few all right let's do a, an amalgamation yeah yeah <laughs> so what's uh what's up first yeah so like costa rica it was you know a one mile run and then we get mm -hmm. on the bike and we're on the bike for you know probably a day and a half oh, um wow. yeah and you know you're biking through the night <laughs> and then i remember one night it was raining so bad um and we and it's when you're biking you're not always biking uh right. you hike hike a bike or um you know when you're trekking it's called bushwhacking but when you're on the bike and you go through bush you could be bike whacking um oh, yeah that, it's why would you do that that sounds I awful know. yeah <laughs> the, and this the one night was you know up the skinny little trail that you you wouldn't even want to trek on and it's yeah. red, red clay and it's raining and the water's just pouring, oh. pouring down this trail <laughs> and you're throwing your bike up to this ledge and then you're grabbing trees and you're just trying to scramble up and then throw your bike up again. And like, sometimes that's what it is. Like, but how long does that go on for? Oh, that was forever. <laughs> that was forever. <laughs> yeah. But, um. No, it's not always like that, but it it can be like that. <laughs> yeah, you're not selling it. So where does it go? Yeah. So you get um, on, you get on your mountain bike at the bits where you can sort of get, you know, get some get the wheels turning and get, you know, you get a nice trail to hit for a while, so you can sort of get some kilometers under your belt. Or is it all just yeah. torturous? Like no, some, <laughs> bush sometimes bike it's whacking? yeah. Sometimes it's like logging road, single track, uh, sometimes highway. Um, oh, okay. yeah sometimes like cobble like cobble that's where we busted all our spokes it was like a cobblestone mm -hmm. type surface oh right um yeah I, that that race specifically we had three paddle sections and they were about 20 hours to 24 hours each it was long and, constantly and so paddling. What? <laughs> what like you don't stop um what what kind of boat was that that was the grossest heaviest rubber dinghy the race supplied those ones oh okay. they were, yeah they were awful um okay. they were they were slow yeah uh, and then th what we paddle on is different like uh, one section was you know out towards the ocean and then in through back through into the mangroves which is, you know, it's crocodile infested and <laughs> no, I'm ki not kidding. And the, the howler monkeys are in there, which, which is cool. 
and um, the currents. So you have to plan your current because the currents can move nine to 12 feet depending on the time of day. Right. Uh, and it depends on the day. Um, so each day, <laughs> each day that goes by, it depends on if you're, it's the Wednesday or the Thursday or the Friday. Like it depends when you go through there. Yeah, because you don't the, know how long the, your sections in advance are going to take and when you're going to hit it. Yeah, and the tides can change from, you know, nine feet to like 12 feet high. And right. so you don't want to be stuck in the mangroves on a low tide. You right. So you, you look up the tide charts before you go. Um, right. So you know. Um, like the one time we were going through, we completed the mangroves uh, during the day. And the tide was just going out. So we were in there at mm. high tide. Um, and when the tide's going out, so the water level's dropping. And we mm -hmm. were just coming back inland. And it was just getting dark. So hitting dusk, got our last checkpoint in the dusk. And the, the last checkpoint we found was under the water, which we did. We barely found it. Luckily, there was a team. <laughs> there was a team coming out of that one stretch, and they go, "Oh, by the way, it's under the water." So what? What was this? What was the thing that was under the water? Okay, so the checkpoints are they're like a universal f flag. So it's like a a triangle, and it's got. Uh, ha a triangle of white and a triangle of orange. So okay. that's what you're looking for is these, the orienteering flagging. Uh, so you have you, to collect them to prove that you hit the checkpoint? Yeah, and it's different for most races, but a lot of times you have a passport and it, you punch it and it's got a special design on the punch and you punch it on the correct corresponding checkpoint. So if it's checkpoint 18, you got to clip 18, the box that says 18. If you screw okay. it up, like they won't give you credit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you have to be there. And some of them are, um, you have to take a picture, but you're not allowed a, a cell phone. So you have to have a, an old camera, like an oh, old cool. style digital camera that you yeah. can show them the picture after, but has no GPS or yeah. like ba and battery. And hope that it doesn't get dropped in the water. <laughs> yeah. So you usually take one out of the backup. With backup batteries. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we we're coming back from this one section and um, it was dark and I'm with the navigator and he's navigating, you know, by the moon and the stars and the silhouette of trees on the night sky. And so it just seems like we weren't moving very fast, you know, watching the trees and uh, the tree line against the night sky you can kind of mm -hmm. see because you're in Costa Rica you, the stars are beautiful and so we turn on a headlamp and we can see the 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 river bank and we're not moving mm -hmm. we're just paddling against the current because the current's going in out place. yeah we're yeah. paddling and <laughs> and not moving it's like oh my god and they they warned us yeah they warned us not to uh, anchor on the on the land at night because of the crocodiles because <laughs> the crocodiles <laughs> but we were just like going nowhere so yeah. we, see, we seen this tree it was overhanging so we tied our boats up to it and we're like hey this is a great time to get some sleep so in the, the crocodile that, water in the crocodile water in our boats <laughs> at in the dark so yeah. I'm sure I would not have got a wink of sleep that night. It was a great idea. So <laughs> we probably slept, I'm thinking, um, I think it was about an hour and a half thereabouts. And when you're that tired, you just fall asleep instantly. Mm. Yeah. And then when we woke up, our boats were like, we started here and we tied them to a tree and we woke up, yeah. our boats were like this and our rope up, up to the tree. Ah, because the tide dropped, so we yeah. were tied way up high in this tree. Yeah, we should have tied them up lower, but so, um, yeah, one of the guys he went up and straddled both boats, and he's untying. He's like, "Okay, hey, ready, everybody, we're gonna drop like one, two, three, <laughs> drop." Um, but also through that night, uh, we went through this little section, um, 
because we still had to go through and, and find another point. Um, and the tide was going out, so we high centered through this little inlet. High and centered? What's, what's that? On, on, the, on the bottom of the water, like on this little gravel patch. Yeah. And we had our headlamps on, and you can see the, the land, and you can see all these little orange beady eyes just lining lining the of water and it was all little crocodile eyes <gasps> and you're and we're oh. high we're high centered right in the middle of the water and we're like oh my god so we we get out and we're like pushing the boat just to get out of here it's like oh my god <laughs> there's so many crocodiles around here let's get let's get out of here but yeah these are the adventures and and um yeah so it's the other was um you know, inland on water and it's just, yeah, you're paddling for almost a full day. Oh, I got carpal, wow. yeah, I got carpal tunnel. I was going to say you must get long. blisters and, and all sorts. Yeah. My, well, my hands are just so waterlogged. They look like little, they're almost bulbous on every yeah. finger. They look like yeah. little tree, tree frog hands. Yeah. 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 And just so sore. Like we stopped at this little village, um, and they had closed their restaurant, but they seen us there and they opened up their kitchen and they're like, oh, here's some leftover chicken. You can have whatever. <laughs> and just to open up like the pop cooler door, mm. I couldn't even grab it. Like I had to just like pull <laughs> out with my ha my full hand. Like I couldn't, I couldn't like grab anything. It was, it was just crazy. Yeah. I mean that. That's appropriately named, isn't it? It really does sound like an adventure. Like it sounds like yeah. I don't know something like kids would just be like, "Wow, that's so exciting!" <laughs> yeah, it's a it's like fun fun adventures for adults. We have to get really extreme to, yeah. <laughs> to recreate that. So okay, so that's that's a good story from paddling. What about uh, and we got the mountain biking. I think we know what's going on. So what's the trekking like? Is that similar to, you know, how we might experience trekking in our own lives? Or is it is it grossly different? Do you get lost a lot? Like, how, how does it go? Uh, it depends on the navigator, I guess. Um, yeah, trekking can be over all surfaces. Um, it can be through water. can be through swamp for a few hours. Um yeah, like it depends. Like Wyoming was just hot, hot and long walks on road um, for part of it. The other part was um, in like in Maine, we were going up this mountainside to the top uh, and we actually hit Appalachian Trail. And once you're and the, the trees going up there and we were carrying our life jackets and our paddles and the trees were growing so close together that every time we walk through our life jacket, we get caught on these trees and mm. it was just so slow. Um, mm. So trek, trekking, usually you're doing some bushwhacking somewhere, which mm. is, is very, very slow. And you might be traveling at, you know, 30 minutes per kilometer or, or Whoa. sometimes not at all. Like very rarely are you running. So okay. if you're, you're like think, thinking of like an ultra, event yeah like you're gonna be doing a lot of running um yeah the your packs are generally pretty heavy they're anywhere yeah. from you know 20 to 25 sometimes 30 pounds if you're carrying just the start of your trek and you got you know six liters worth of fluid because you're not sure where you're going to get your next fluid uh hmm. you, you know you could be getting from rivers uh lakes and then you got to treat the water generally before you drink so it so do you take those um those little pellets that you drop in that you get you know people get when they go camping in the backcountry and stuff or is it uh do you yeah. get those like i have this like thing where you put the water in it and it sort of trickles down out the bottom like how do you do it uh it depends on the race like i use those little iodine tablets yeah you plop it yeah. in you gotta wait 15 minutes um some events we had or one event we had like an ultraviolet uh, pen that you circle around in the water for two to three minutes and it kills all the bacteria. Oh, and wow. then, That's yeah. Cool. And then in Panama, we used uh, liquid drops. And with those, you 
you can drink the water, you know, within five minutes. Huh. Okay. If you mix it. And and have have you had any experiences where that's been a problem? Like you sort of were banking on getting a water at you know, you look at your map, you're like, I think we can get water here and you get mm-hmm. there and there's none there. Like is that a big issue? Yeah, like in Wyoming it was so hot. Um the a couple of the guys ran out of water and we ended up having to share. Like I had a like a liter left and it was still a few hours from to the transition for the kayak. Uh, yeah, so we had to share water and I don't mm. like to share anything. Like I'm not that I don't like sharing. I don't like sharing. <laughs> I don't like sharing no, I think, food. I think people get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, or my water spigot. Like I don't like, you know, so we had to share, you know, you know, everything. So just to, okay. to keep everybody alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the so, water sources aren't always there when you expect and sometimes you drink more than you think you need right okay so we take that uh was it costa rica you said was the night the one that was nine, nine days, days long yeah so you had the three 24-hour rafting adventures with crocodiles yeah. um yeah. was that the one with the clay mountain biking <laughs> oh that's the one with the clay yeah and yeah, okay uh, so how did the, the hike hike go on that one um or was the hike... that was the other parts to it or was it just hiking is in addition to those two um i think we hiked about three times in that one and we biked three times the um i'm trying to remember what we did for ropes in that race i can't remember i'm sorry they like all like mishmash together sometimes well could, Uh, could you give us an example of of a just any rope is it like a descent? So they've set ropes up on a rock face or are you sort of clambering up them? Like how does the rope, is it more like scrambling with rope guides? How do, how does it work exactly? It can be different from race to race. So um, some races they say bring ascenders. So they have a mandatory gear list. Um, oh, okay. So you bring ascenders. So they're like yeah. two little things that you just go up and then you have stirrups for your feet. Yeah. Uh, some races are those. Some races you traverse, like across a uh, river. So you're hand over hand, you know, like pulling yourself across. <laughs> like a buggy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And sometimes um, that's like right in the middle of a bike. So I, not in any of the races I've done, but there was one where they had to sling their bike on and guide their bike along with them. How on earth would you do that? Yeah, you just get a carabiner on your bike and you kind of wrap your feet with it and then as you go hand over hand <laughs> okay the, i got you yeah you you just pull it with your feet um so and then a lot of them are just repelling like you you get off the top and just repel down so is that like abseiling uh i don't know if we maybe have a different word in england for it's where you sort of you hook yourself onto the the rope and you sort of back up and yeah. you put your feet on the rock face and you sort of walk down backwards yeah or it could okay. be su- suspended in midair, but yeah. Okay. Or, yeah. Or, You're sort yeah. of going down, descending on the rope. Yeah. And yeah. is there is there like scrambling sort of rock climbing type stuff, or did they not expect sort of? Because uh, I mean, if you go like rock climbing, you can you can buy a ton of gear and you can stick your rocks in the wall and and climb yourself up. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of heavy gear. Uh, is it more like scrambling if there's rocks involved, like upwards? Yeah, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of scrambles. Okay. Yeah, it's mostly the previous stuff we talked about. Just... Yeah, so you don't need a lot of rock climbing gear aside from the probably some carabiners and the um, yeah. harness and some rope skills, but it's not like you're going to be carrying your rope by the sounds of it. No, we don't carry any ropes. Thank God, because they're heavy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean that'd be. I mean, this whole th- concept sounds pretty ridiculous, but that, that sounds yeah. a little bit much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, okay, so you... um, there's, I mean, they have to make sure you're safe generally. And <laughs> it it's um, sound like it. It doesn't sound like anyone's making sure you're safe. <laughs> generally. Um, so that, that's safely why. Safely surrounded by crocodiles falling yeah. asleep in a diggy tied to a tree. It doesn't yeah. sound very safe. Um, I'm not saying there's never been any deaths in this sport, but, um, <laughs> But but the the rope sections like they do put them together so that the ropes are securely 
hmm. uh, t- tied. Yeah. I mean, if, if you can imagine you're like day seven, tired as yeah. hell, and you, you're securing your own ropes to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's just do, asking for trouble at that point. Yeah. So they do rope yeah. checks, like make sure you're, when you're, when you hook in, Yeah. they make sure that you're hooked in proper so that yeah. you're not. So I, mean, I guess that was one thing I was thinking. It's not like you have to be, you know, an experienced um, mountain climber um like mountaineer kind of thing where because that's quite a technical sport like you know it's it's not something you can learn easily um but it sounds like those sections it's more about it's not advanced um sort of rock skills it's it's more yeah um simple rock skills yeah yeah we don't have to be you know trained on you know how to do finger holds and yeah it's, it's not yeah. like that like if if yeah. you're repelling though like you, you definitely need to know how to repel hmm. and you should What's have that? a a backup like a prusik because if you're tired or you know if your hand slips and you fall to your death i mean i mean that is possible if you don't use mm-hmm. a prusik so or use a prusik properly like how to set mm-hmm. it up so and so I mean, that brings me nicely to my next question, which is, uh, let's say, if you can remember from your first, um, how do you how do you get prepared for something like this? Like, how do you train? Where do you start? Uh, well, you should be doing some long hikes. Like, okay. Yeah. Uh, and figuring out your gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, like blisters are pretty common, but mm-hmm. you but you can go. I think I went through that race. I think I, I went through all the races without blisters except for Panama. It was my first blister on my feet. But uh, some people get just gross blisters and they can't even walk. Mm-hmm. Uh, so foot, foot preparation and looking after feet during the race. Um, so knowing your gear, because there's some shoes that really rub you terribly. Mm-hmm. So when you're training, you're doing lots of hikes, some mm-hmm. hike running, and you know, sign up for some ultras if you want some fun along the way. Doing okay. lots of endurance biking. Mm-hmm. Um, it wouldn't hurt to know some single track bike skills because mm-hmm. there there are some technical parts on the bike. Um, but main and mainly just doing a lot of endurance work. You don't have to be doing any VO2 efforts uh, mm-hmm. for this sport, you know, just doing some long three to six hour rides, mm-hmm. some long six hour treks mm-hmm. um, and, and some kayaking. You probably should do some kayaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. what I was going to ask, you know, is it, is it kayaking? Is that the best way to prepare yourself for the paddle sections? Yeah, like for Panama, um, one of my friends, he lent me his indoor paddle kayak trainer. And it's a little different like when you go to the gym where you have the, the rower like yeah. this. This one's actually a bar set up on a, on a cable system. Yeah. And you actually hold it like a kayak paddle yeah. and, oh, okay. and, and kayak. And it's indoor got, ki- okay, I didn't and know he's got this. these pulleys that, yeah, you just sit in this, this seat and you just... It's called Paddle One. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's called Paddle One. So you just train in, I, I trained in my basement for the kayak because it was winter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. No, no kayaking in Canada in, in the winter. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, that, I mean, that's also always a challenge, isn't it, for, for Canadians? Uh, yeah. Anything in the spring or anything just like crazy long like this, you know, trying to build that big aerobic base six or nine months in advance can be very hard. So yeah. you have to be patient with the indoor stuff i didn't know about indoor kayaking that's a yeah that's a new form of uh what's the word (laughs) strange ways to pass your weekend mornings yeah (laughs) in your Uh, basement that's right kayak that doesn't move anywhere a lot of movie watching a lot of movie watching but um and then the as far as the packs go i would throw some dumbbells and some towels and throw them, mm-hmm. throw them in my backpack. So I'll, I'll start, oh, yeah. start light. I'll start with like a 10 pound dumbbell mm-hmm. and then, and then hydration and then go on some running on some trails around the, mm-hmm. around the city. 
um, and then I'll move up to a 20 pound dumbbell. Mm -hmm. So I, I work it up so that, you know, the, the muscles here, the traps and everything mm. is just used to that kind of weight in the back. So your muscles are and the skin as well. Like as your, your skin's going to rub on, on your neck and stuff. And like you said, the, yeah. the blisters and stuff and the blisters on your hands, you have to toughen up all that skin, don't you? Which takes months and months. Of... Well, actually it's, it's, it's quite the opposite. You want, um, nice, soft, supple skin. Okay. You, all right. You... You're going to have to educate me here. Cause that sounds strange. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, cause if you have calluses, let's say you have a callus that gets wet. Yeah. then it's going to rub worse than if your feet are supple. Okay. So I use um, Zincofax, like diaper rash cream. Oh, and yeah. I, I slather my, because if you, if you have a, if you ever had a baby and you put diaper rash cream on. I have to, a baby currently. And to, to wash that stuff off is almost impossible. Mm. Like you, you actually need soap to cut it, to cut it yeah. off. Like, so it's the best barrier for moisture to your skin that you can use. So, um, okay. so yeah, some races I had some, you know, knowing your gear, um, there were some shoes I had, you know, where your insoles meet your, the shoe. So you have your insole mm -hmm. sitting in the shoe and then at that corner where they meet can be a rub point mm -hmm. where your skin gets soft and then it sort of sinks into there and then it rubs, um, mm -hmm having your shoes um, tied up a little tighter than you would normally do it so that your shoe isn't moving around mm. is a good idea. Because uh, the more your shoe moves around, the more friction you're going to get. Mm. And then um, the one race I pre-taped my feet along that area where the insole meets the shoe. Yeah. So, so I would just run sports tape along there. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. run tape all up the back of my Achilles. Yeah. So it just reduces any type of rubbing. And then you do that, and then do you put the uh, is it Sudacrem or, or whatever that the, the yeah. Rash cream on the on your foot, kind of over the top of that, and then put a sock on. Yeah, and then put the sock on. Okay, we're getting, getting very practical in this episode. Yeah. I'm presuming that everybody's going to be signing up for adventure races now oh, and give should. them some good. Well, <laughs> well, you, I mean, you might. I think you might. You're, uh, you almost we, lost everyone at the crocodile story, I think. But then yeah. you sort of, I think you you won us round again with some of the adventure kind of um, tales. Well, the, there's shorter races. and Well, we that's just, what I was going to ask. Yeah. If someone's a newbie, you know, and you were like, they want to get into it, but they don't know where to start. What, what would you suggest? So we just had that scenario. There's a race in Medicine Hat that we were at just two, week, two weeks ago. And... There was uh, two men from Red Deer that was going to go do it. it. It's the light race, so it's a five-hour race, and they have mm -hmm. a nine-hour nine, nine hour race. And so then I encouraged a few of my friends, and there was five teams going down. And mm. there's only one person uh, in the group that's ever done one besides, <laughs> besides myself. Right. So uh, months leading up, we did a little workshop in my house on how to oh, orient wow, cool. on how to orienteer, how to use a compass, um, how to read a um, topographical map, because that's what you get. And mm -hmm. then I set up a few courses around Red Deer. So one was a bike okay. a bike course and how yeah. to navigate through that. And then I set up a trekking course down by Innisfil, one yeah. in a little park, and then along the river. And so how to, how to aim off and how to, you know, read the features on the map and use the features yeah. as handrails and things like that, just to know where you are and know where you're going. And that, so you would set it up almost like a race you had, okay, here's a checkpoint, here's another checkpoint, and there's your next checkpoint, and you have to orientate from one yeah. to the next and using yeah. your feet or your bike or whatever it is you guys decide. Yeah. Ah, cool. Yeah. And then um, there's also in Canmore, and I heard they're in Red Deer too, but in Canmore at the Nordic Center, they have a orienteering course there. Okay. Yeah, you can and buy them. Yeah, because I yeah. heard that that's a good place to start when I was doing a little research on this, that like getting mm -hmm. involved with an orientating, orientation, orienteering, excuse me, uh, yeah. club, or yeah. getting some uh, tuition on that is a really 
helpful thing, even though you're probably not going to be the navigator, I would have thought, when you're doing your first event. So that's a good question. Like, how might someone find a team if this is a team sport? Yeah, so that race was team of two. Um, so with, with the five teams we took down, they were people from, mostly people from our triathlon club. So mm-hmm. we, we think we're going to rename our club um, a multi-sport club instead oh, of yeah, cool. triathlon okay. club because now we're yeah. multi-sporting it. Yeah. Um, my partner was my strength coach from 360 Fitness, yeah. and he's never done anything like this before. In fact, he didn't, even, he didn't even have a bike, uh, yours. <sighs> So he borrowed a bike. I, I, kinda, I think I've met him. I don't. I don't remember. I think I did meet him though one time. Yeah. Three sixty. Yeah. Tall, okay. tall guy. Really tall. Um. Yeah. Didn't have a bike. Doesn't run. Just does weights. How did he do? Yeah. Not good. His he, being six foot three, he was a faster trekker than I was. He right. was able to scale over logs better than I was. Yeah. In the bu- bushwhacking parts. Um. Yeah. On the bike, he did pretty good. Yeah, hmm. he's able to okay. almost. And so, that. did all five of your teams finish? Yes. So, um, oh man, that's cool. Yeah, on the light race, um, the four it was four and a half hours instead of five. Uh, the one team of girls got first place in their division. Oh wow! Uh, cool. Yeah, first place, and then the the two guys got third. Yeah, and then. Um, in the nine hour race, we got 13th in the mixed, and then the other two girls were 13th in the women's, and then uh, the other mixed, there's somewhere down the bottom, but it was a, a dad and daughter team. Mm-hmm. And that was their first race, but now she's hooked. Yeah, they're all hooked. And there's a Grand Prairie race coming up all right. uh, off the grid in August. And it's a okay. 13 hour race, I believe. Involves- so, what are the disciplines for that one? So that one is um, some pack rafting. So you have to have a pack raft and you carry that and uh, mountain biking and trekking. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Oh, man. Yeah. I was, so, uh, yeah. It's, it, once you start watching the videos, it's very exciting. Like when I first heard about it, I was like, this sounds like, I don't know, kind of nuts. <laughs> but yeah. then after you watch it for a bit, you're like, oh, okay. And then talking through it with you and you're like step by step what you need what you have to learn it's like okay it's a little outside the box but it's the same process you figure out what you've got to know then you figure out how you're going to learn it then you figure out how fit you've got to be and what you're going to be able to do Mm -hmm. then you figure out how you're going to be able to train for that you know it's easy to take it step by step i guess yeah it's still pretty it still still sounds a bit crazy though (laughs) it's so exciting it's like a scavenger hunt for adults it's just so yeah, much, yeah. That's why I was so saying. It's got that kind of adventure-y kind of something like the Goodies or something, you know, yeah. kind of a um, feel yeah. to it. It's great. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you'll go, uh, you know, you'll go a couple hours sometimes. Like in big races, you'll go hours without seeing a checkpoint. So you're just like, mm. it, it. Like we talked about the mental game, but in in the shorter races, there's a lot of ra- there's a lot of checkpoints, and you have to get them in order. And then mm-hmm. there's optional. So how, how it really works. Well, Medicine Hat was a little bit different format than I've ever seen before. But generally, um, the rules and how they work is you have a series of mandatory checkpoints. And then there's usually optional checkpoints. And then there's a time limit. Mm-hmm. So you have to get the mandatory checkpoints usually in order. And then the optionals are sprinkled in. And you can get them usually in any order you want. And anywhere amongst the mandatories, but the mandatories, you have to go one and then two. You can't, you can't go one, then five, then four. Like if Mm -hmm. there's some in a, in the same area, you have to get them in order. And then you need to come across the finish line before the deadline. If you Mm -hmm. don't, you're a DNF. Mm -hmm. So it's very time dependent. So why would you want the extra ones though? Why would, why would that help you? Yeah. So then, okay, let's, let's give a scenario of say three, three teams and they come across the finish line all at the same time. Um, okay. And one team's got all their mandatories and one optional. The other team's got all their mandatories and 
six optional and the other one's got just their mandatories. But they came across the line all at the same time. Um, the one with more optionals is going to be the winner because mm-hmm. they've, they've got more points. What if they finish three hours later, though? Or let's say an hour later. Yeah, so let's say you've got more optionals, but you came in three hours later. Yeah. You, you still win because you've got more checkpoints. So they'll have like a scoring system? So, well, it's you're basically a point per checkpoint in most races. It's just how okay. many checkpoints you've achieved. So even so if, if you, you finish a lot later, but you have more checkpoints, you'll win? You'll as win. long as you meet the cutoff. As long as you come in under the time. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's another interesting, like you're saying, uh, another mental challenge. It's like, do we have time to go get this one? Yeah. Get another point and get there before the time runs out or not? Because if we do that, we'll get a point, but we might risk DNFing. And if we go straight right. for the finish, we might not win because we didn't get the extra point. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. You have to kind of figure that out. It sounds so, uh, ready for some tension between teammates. Do you get, is there, is there a lot of arguing on these things? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a, usually you go into it with, you know, saying there's no, there's no, there's no arguing. There's discussions. There's mm-hmm. uh, discussions about, like if it's two people, you can have discussions about best route, but usually the navigator just takes you through. But if mm-hmm. there's a question on, you know, sh- should we go, do we have time? Like, do we have time to mm-hmm. get the optional? Um, Cause there, that's where the strategy comes in. You know, sometimes it's maybe worth just getting one optional. Mm-hmm. It's like the price is right. You know, it's like you have, <laughs> it's like, Oh, I bid a thousand. Well, I'm going to a thousand and one. As right, long yeah. as you're, if, as long as you're not over the price, yeah, you you yeah. just won because you're a dollar more than yeah, the next okay. guy. But, um, so yeah, time is a factor. Speed is a factor. You want to be as trained as best as possible, and move quickly. Um, if you miss a checkpoint, then you're un- you're unranked, or depending on the race director and what if it's a, just a local fun race. They might have not have that ranked unranked thing. They might just say, hmm. "Well, you know, you've got thirteen out of twenty mandatories. You got the first thirteen in order, you know. So we'll we'll give you all that, and then you'll just, mm-hmm. you know, you just slot it in whatever order you came in with, however many points you got, and you're under the time. If you're over the time, right. you're DNF." But you're yeah, under the okay. time, and you got this. This yeah, and you know. then we see see who did the best. Okay, so where your place? And so, is at. if someone wanted to learn more about it, you know, they're not quite ready to sign up, but they're like, "What's some? Do you have some good things that you would recommend they check out? Like whether it be you know particular people on social media or YouTube or a particular website you would um, that you found valuable and helpful over the years? Is, is there anything like that? Any resources you might point people to? Yeah, like the when I first learned orienteering, I scavenged YouTube for and as much as I could, mm-hmm. and looked at all the legitimate like how how to get a bearing, how to aim off, you know, how to you know how to know where you are, like taking two two bearings from the wilderness and plot it on the map, like just to find mm-hmm. yourself. Um, yeah, just looking at every YouTube you can find because in mm-hmm. depending where you are, like some cities have clubs or you train clubs. Mm-hmm. Some don't like Red Deer doesn't. Mm-hmm. So, but then you can go. And then I went to Canmore and did that little course, mm-hmm. which was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And some, okay. so some cities have, is, yeah, yeah, some, some, some have courses like, um, like you pay a fee and someone instructs you on how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, but that would okay, be the okay. first part. Yeah, but then you have to know things like declination. Like, what's the declination of your area? Like, we're like 12 and a half degrees east in Red Deer, so a positive. There's, you know, because there's magnetic, <laughs> there's magnetic north and a true north. And then there's declination because the earth moves, right? So every year your okay. declination is a bit different. And if you don't adjust for that, is you it? could... 
you could be go navigating the wrong air spot. And if you so don't like know north how to, changes. Yeah. It does. Oh man, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it moves. <laughs> Cuz the earth tilts a little bit different every year. It changes just a minusculely, but and then okay. you know how to read a map and when was the mm. map printed? It could have been pr- printed back in or last surveyed back in like 1982 so mm. so these are those like really detailed big topographical maps that have yeah. like crazy amounts of detail on which are much much different to the you can't use google maps right it's, you can't just print off a google map it's, that's right <laughs> you're not you're allowed going. any other map than what they give you that's usually the rule oh, okay okay yeah. i didn't know that so you have to take an account um when that map was last surveyed and then mm-hmm. but when they print it it depends what they request because they, they can print with different layers and oh, okay. there, there could be like new pipeline roads or new lease roads or new, new trails that were, um, that you don't see or new, mm-hmm. new, the waterways might have dried up. Mm-hmm. Like it may show a, a, a pond or something, but you know, 40 years later, we're, cause we're 40 years later, you know, it might have dried up. Yeah. So, like, you have to take an account of some things never move, like mountains. Like, it'll be yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some contour lines, they generally don't change much. Yeah. But, but th- some things like rivers or trails, you know, they might not be. You've got to check the edge of the map. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. That, were, yeah. Well, that was fascinating. Thank yeah. you for it's coming lot, on to talk to us. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll put some links in the in the description to uh, shoot you emails with questions if mm-hmm. anyone's excited to get into this crazy sport. Yeah, and you never know, maybe someone wants to do off the grid. Uh, contact me, and we'll and they live in my area. We can get together and. So that one is August. That one's in August. Yeah, last weekend okay, in so August I mean... is Saturday. Just for anyone who's listening close to the time, this will, this will come out in May 2022. Yeah. So, but I suppose they'll be having it annually. And annually. I'm sure, um, Teresa, you'd be okay with people emailing you if they have questions. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Also, I'll put a link in the description. Thank you. That was, that was really cool. That was really interesting. Um, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the recording there.